Good morning. Help us worship our God this morning, the lion and the lamb. God this morning. Amen. Hey, good to see you. Welcome, and we're glad you're here with us. I'm going to pray for us as we worship today. A uh, special welcome to you if you're a first time visitor with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for it, uh, this beautiful day that we have uh, to come and worship you. And wherever we come from, however we come, uh, maybe we're upbeat, maybe we're downcast, uh, maybe we're elated, maybe we're depressed. And may we're encouraged, may we're discouraged, wherever we come from. Father, thank you that you bring us here and you will meet us here where two or three are gathered in your name. I pray that we would not have any distraction 
we would give you our best worship. We'd give you our best praise, our best confession, our best thanksgiving. And, and then we would hear from you today. You'd speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, say hi to some people around you. Welcome them, okay? Where two or more are gathered in his name, he is here for all who come, who run to him in faith, he is here. And there is power in the name of Jesus. Jesus came. 
amazing how we can see God in in nature itself see his footprint and it's good to recognize that it's good to worship him for what he's given us for what he's done for us so join us this morning as we see God in in everything we see that is good
So I tell people I'm never alone, even when I'm alone, because I'm always there's always this conversation going on in my head, and, and so I'm always thinking about communicating because I try to do that with you, and and I um, I think about how we should update our our saying. So this is kind of funny. I, I was telling the the worship team that this morning and asked them for their help. Uh, so if I was going to update, somebody said the early bird gets the worm. If I was going to update that, what, what would I say today? And we settled on the early bird gets the Bitcoin. Wouldn't that be cool? But then I said, well, we should make it like you get the, the latest toy fad. And the only one I could think of, okay, they've been laughing at me about this all morning. The only one I could think of is the early bird gets the Cabbage Patch Kid. <laughs> That's not really updated. It was from the 80s, right? I'm not really, I mean, like showing that I'm kind of old. So, uh, but that's, I, I like seeing how people evolve and change. You know, I, I think about where I was at 16, and I will tell you, I never would have imagined some 30 years later that I would actually like, 40 years later, <laughs> let me do my math, I should, I should like to watch soccer, but I'm a big soccer fan now. Uh, I, we had no soccer teams in high school where I grew up. Uh, we, you know, we were in Georgia, which is football, football, football. And we didn't have soccer. But I, I'll get up early on Saturday morning to watch Chelsea, my favorite English Premier League team, play if they're playing the early game. I, I'm telling you, it's, it's – uh, and so I'm a big fan of the U.S. men's and women's national team. Uh, I love watching them play. If they're in World Cup qualifying or World Cup for sure, I watch it. And so this last year, there was a great crisis. I don't know. If you don't follow, you don't know this, but uh, the men's national team, for the first time – in over 20 years, failed to qualify for the World Cup in Russia this year, this summer. And so it was, uh, it, it was bad. I mean, we were in prime position to qualify in October, and we went to Trinidad and Tobago, which was the very last team in our group. Everybody thought we would beat them, and we lost. And so uh, the director lost his job, the coach lost his job, uh, pointing, what happens when bad things happen? in an organization or a family or a marriage. Human nature is that we start pointing the fingers. We start figuring out who to blame, right? That doesn't happen? Yes. Yes, in churches, when things get tight or go wrong, people start doing that. When in organizations, schools, workplaces, families, marriages, that's what we tend to do. You know, at the, it, was it the director's fault of the U.S. soccer program? They just elected a new director. That's why I was thinking about it this week. They deciding on which ways to go. Uh, was it the coach's fault? Was it the player's fault? Here's what healthy organizations, healthy marriages do. You recognize there's a problem, but you face it together. You learn what it is that you can change, but the, the placing of blame, the trying to lay your guilt and shame on others is counterproductive. Learning and moving forward, that's what we do. We've come in the Apostles' Creed study to this curious phrase that I believe in Jesus Christ who suffered under Pontius Pilate. It's funny how the creed goes straight from Jesus was born, we talked about the virgin birth last week, to he suffered. And if you think about it, you never really see Jesus in the Gospels smiling or laughing. Surely he did. People like to be around him, but, but you never see that. At an early age, Herod tried to kill him. When he started his ministry, his own people rejected him. He went through lots of suffering. But in particular, what that points to is the last week of Jesus' life. In particular, the last 24 hours of it. I want to talk about today who killed Jesus. I want us to try to figure out what happened and how we should respond to it. And I think it will be fruitful for us. I think it will be productive for us as we move in to a celebration again of Holy Week. As we are six weeks away, Ash Wednesday was this past Wednesday, we're six weeks away from Easter, April 1st. I, I think it's important for us to think about this question, who killed Jesus? I want to look at it from three perspectives today. So it'll actually be three different answers. The first is a historical perspective. 
I tell you, I can't think about this question without remembering, and it's been 14 years ago, hard as that is to believe, The Passion of the Christ, the movie that Mel Gibson produced and directed. It was a movie I've seen one time, and that's all I could see it. It was very realistic, very graphic, very gory, but I think that's how it was. And as I think about that, I, I think about several scenes. And, and when the Apostles' Creed, the early church came up with this creed, they, they said suffered under Pontius Pilate. The Pontius Pilate is frequently and kind of the, the center of this movie in terms of what happened in historically in Jesus actually being crucified, him being sentenced to die. Uh, you could look in the different Gospels and uh, listen, maybe it's a, something for you to do this week is to, to read the different gospel accounts and compare and contrast them about uh, Jesus before Pilate, the, 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 all that happened for him to be crucified. Because there's some difference in each of those accounts. I'm going to look at Luke chapter 23. We're going to look at that together. Uh, but you could look at the different accounts, and I'll weave in some of that as we talk. Uh, I want to look at Luke 23 beginning with verse 1 to see... Who killed Jesus historically? Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah King. And so Pilate asked Jesus, Are the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Uh, then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. So basically, he's innocent in my eyes. <clears throat> but they insisted. Now, they had tried this not paying taxes and that kind of stuff, but this is what they go to. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. <clears throat> Basically, you read Pilate, and, and, and he's, he's presented with this problem. He's kind of indifferent to it. If anything, he thinks Jesus is innocent. Now, Pilate was the governor of Judea, <clears throat> the Roman governor. The Roman Empire, Empire was vast. And so you had big, important places within that uh, that had lots of population, lots of taxes coming in. And then you had smaller places, just like we have 50 United States. Uh, Pilate was a governor of Judea, which was not that big a, a deal. It was kind of an out-of-the-way backwater place. In the empire, probably no one in Rome had heard much about Jesus at this point. They, they didn't know about it. Pilate really didn't care. As I told you a couple weeks ago, he didn't really care about religious stuff. But he, what he did care about was taxes getting paid and the peace being kept. And so they go to this fallback of, you know, if... He, he's going to start a riot. He's going to start a rebellion. And so that's their charge. But Pilate says, no, I don't want anything to do with it. Go to Herod. Well, if you read, we, I talked about Herod a, a couple months ago. I don't want to go into that again. But basically, Herod th saw him innocent as well and, and bounced him back to Pilate. And so we skip down to verse 13. Pilate called together the chief priest and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Again, he's innocent. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. He's trying to hit a middle ground. You know, I'm going I'm to give him a scourging. I'm going to give him a whipping, which is bad enough. But then I'm going to let him go. But the whole crowd shouted, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished. And then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for. 
and surrender Jesus to their will. There's the bottom line. You see, Pilate, in this position, believed Jesus to be innocent. If you read in other accounts, you see that his wife, Claudia, dreamed about this happening. And this is where the Passion of the Christ brings this to life, if you watch the movie. And by the way, I think if you don't watch it, if you've seen it and it's etched on your mind, if you've never seen it, I think you need to watch it. If you don't need to see it again, but you remember all of it, uh, as I do, then, then you don't have to watch it again. But you do need to think about what happened here. That Jesus is presented, he's declared innocent. Claudia comes to Pilate and she says, don't you dare give in to that crowd. Because uh, I saw in a dream that he's innocent. And yet, Pilate chooses the easy way. Pilate has a solution. He sees him as innocent, yet he is guilty historically. He signed the death warrant. He is guilty of having Jesus put to death. Now, some people would say today, who killed Jesus? The Jews did. And, and I will tell you, the passion has been used for justifying anti-Semitic views and behavior, being against Jewish people. But I will tell you, not all the Jewish people hated Jesus. Not all the people were in that crowd that said crucify him. In fact, many of them followed him. And after he rose and came back, most of the early church came from a Jewish background. Certainly in the beginning. It was not all the Jewish people. Some didn't have much of an opinion. Some were for him. But the leaders were threatened by him and they were against him. But ultimately, it is Pilate who bears the greatest weight of the guilt if you ask this question historically because he knew Jesus was innocent and yet he sentenced him to death anyway now let me say uh, perhaps the most pointed the thing that makes me think the most is recorded for us in John the gospel of John uh, verse 18 this has Jesus and it gives us a little different understanding that that this conversation happened with Jesus in the private the residence of the Roman governor. The Jewish leaders didn't go to this conversation because it would make them unclean for Passover. So it's just Jesus and Pilate talking. And again, this is depicted in the movie. Now, Pilate says to Jesus, don't you know I have the power to release you or to crucify you? But then later in their conversation, it gets down to this. This is verses 37 and 38. You are a king then said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Retorted Pilate. He lived 2,000 years ago, but he sounds like he lived around the corner today. What is truth? With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. He won't commit to objective truth. We live in a relativistic culture. And I will guarantee you, you've heard people say this. You maybe even have thought it. Maybe even you think it today. Relativism means that what's true for you is up to you. What's true for me is up to me. There's no objective truth. There's no objective right or wrong. It's to be determined by each individual person. Well, I say this to you just as Jesus said. He came to show us the truth, that we were created in God's image, that we choose with our free will to disobey God, to not do what he wants us to do, or to sometimes do what he doesn't want us to do. We're created and we sin, all of us, that is the truth, and that sin incurs punishment. There has to be consequences for it, and there is only one way to deal with it. it. The answer is not blaming or making excuses for that. What is truth? Well, at this basic level, Pilate wouldn't commit. And in the movie, his wife says to him, you don't see it even when it's right in front of you. Well, I think it's important for us to think about because we need to see the truth. But let's think about who killed Jesus from a spiritual perspective. Let's turn the page because I think there's a different answer. Some 700 years before the Passion, 
the prophet Isaiah was inspired by God. He was given a vision by God to talk about the coming Messiah. And all throughout the New Testament, you see the writers equating Isaiah 53, the man depicted there, commonly called the suffering servant. They equate that picture of the coming Messiah with Jesus. They say Jesus is the fulfillment of the Messiah. And the heart of it is in verses 4 through 6. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Four hours in these first, four, uh, first two verses. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Those are fancy words for sin that I just talked about. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Powerful words, words you need to understand, words you need to understand to, to know this, that spiritually speaking, who killed Jesus? We all did. Each of us did. Here's a fact most people don't know. Although Mel Gibson financed, produced, and directed The Passion of the Christ, he appears in only one scene. As Jesus is being nailed to the cross, a man's hand appears, making a fist, holding the nail above Jesus' outstretched palm, showing the soldiers how to do their grisly work. The hand holding the nail belongs to Mel Gibson. It's the only place he appears, and his fist is all you see. He wanted it that way so that the world would know that it was his sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. He was interviewed by Diane Sawyer about the movie. And she asked him, who killed Jesus? He said, we all did. Isaiah 53 says that. And if you understand that, if you can stop excusing and look at yourself honestly... We get that. Oh, we like to make excuses. We, we like to look at other people and see how they're more selfish or they're more evil or they're more foolish or they're more wrong than we are. We like to blame. But I would suggest that if we think honestly in a spiritual sense who killed Jesus, I did. You did. Bernard Clairvaux in the 12th century, he wrote, uh, a song which we sometimes sing, O sacred head now wounded. What thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. Lo, here I fall, my Savior, tis I deserve thy place. Look on me with thy favor and grant to me thy grace. Our whole problem, the problem of the human race, is mine, mine was the transgression. Mine, mine was the sin. Our sins have cut us off from God, so we're left to our own feeble devices. We think we're pretty good people. And maybe it's true. We haven't done the terrible things we read about other people doing on, to people on the news or read on the computer. But our hands, not one of us, our hands are not clean. We have cheated we have lied, we have gossiped, we have falsely accused, we have made excuses, we cut corners, we have lost our temper, we have mistreated others. When we finally get a glimpse of the cross of Christ, we see clearly how great our sin really is. In the light of Calvary, all our supposed goodness is nothing but filthy, filthy rags. That is why the greatest Christians have always had the most profound sensitivity to sin. Hear that again. That is why the greatest Christians have always had the most profound sensitivity to sin. The closer you come to Jesus, the more clearly you see your own sin. I will say to you, I didn't always think about that. But you look at what happened with Jesus being crucified. It had to happen to take care of the ugliness the repulsiveness of us doing our own selfish stuff that hurt others, that hurt ourselves, that hurt God. 
the, the more you walk with God, the more you see how hurtful, how smelly, how repulsive sin is and what it does to you and the people you love. And we must embrace our own responsibility. And I hope that's a response from you this spring as we celebrate Easter, that you embrace it. Don't make excuses. Embrace it. Isaiah made it clear 700 years before Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. Isaiah made it clear that it was our fault. And also that we could be saved. We could be forgiven. We could be set free. I remind you of what it said in Isaiah 53. Verse 6, if you want to go to heaven, listen to verse 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. That is, all of us have sinned and been selfish and done what God didn't want us to do or haven't done what God wants us to do. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. One man said it this way, he stooped down low with the first all, but he stood up straight with the last all. The sin problem, the consequence has to be taken care of. And we like to think sometimes we can work our way out of trouble. We can talk our way out of trouble. But there's not a person here. Believe me, I tried for a while. There's not a person here that can take care of it on their own. We all spiritually killed Jesus. Thirdly, ultimately, this might surprise you, but I think ultimately God killed Jesus. Now, it's hard for me to imagine. I have three sons. It's hard for me to imagine being complicit in any of them dying, but this was what happened. Isaiah 53, 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord, or though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. If that doesn't make it clear, Acts 4, 27 and 28, indeed Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city in Jerusalem. They're praying to God to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you appointed. Now listen to this. They, they were complicit. They were evil, Herod and Pontius Pilate. They thought he was innocent, yet they conspired to make him be crucified anyway so the crowd would be happy. They gave in to popular demand, but they did, God, what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. God loved you. And me so much that he provided an atoning sacrifice for your selfishness, for your sin. It's powerful. But Jesus had a choice, and Jesus complied. Jesus obeyed. Yes, the human part of him in the Garden of Gethsemane wondered if there was another way, balked at doing this, but he said yes because it's your will, and it's affirmed for us. John 10, 17 and 18, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I received from my father. God decided beforehand that Jesus had to die. And Jesus willingly, because he loves you, because he loves me, said, I'll go. I will suffer. I'll take the place. You put your name there. I'll take Sid's place. So here's the response for you today, I think. Is it time for you to turn away from sin and self and come and believe in Jesus as the Christ, as you're making him your Lord and Savior? For others of us who already believe, how much the sin and what it caused Jesus to go through, how much do we see it? How much do we turn away? 
How much do we thank him? How much do we remember? Let me tell you the greatest sin that you can commit today. You, you can't crucify him over again. That happened 2,000 years ago. The greatest sin I think any of us can have today is to ignore what Jesus has done for you. It is to be indifferent to it. I spent 15, 20 years being indifferent, not really appreciating or understanding how much God loved me and what it cost him to offer me forgiveness, to offer me heaven, to offer me eternity. The book of Isaiah or 53 ends with this verse, verse 12. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death. What that says is, because Jesus gave himself up, because he was that sacrifice, that atoning sacrifice for all people, all sins of all time, he will have glory. He'll be in eternity and was numbered with the transgressors. He didn't know sin, but he took our sin. And for he bore the sin of many and made an intercession for the transgressors. The greatest sin you can commit today is to not care that Jesus took on your sin and offered you forgiveness. This morning, 6.53, I was driving back to my house. I'd been here getting ready for today. And, you know, uh, I will tell you, sin, is, it equates to me to the black of night. When there's no moon, the clouds are up, there's no stars. I mean, you can't see in front of your face. Oftentimes, I get home late at night, no lights on. I have, you all see me trying to get my key in the door. Uh, but it's dark, you can't see anything. That's, that's sin, right, until we wake up. We're just making a mess of our relationships with our boyfriend or girlfriend, our, our wife or our husband, our kids, our coworkers. But then we can see the light if we believe, if we accept what Jesus has done for us. This is what I saw. So I stopped and took a picture. Isn't it cool you have a camera on your phone in your, in your, in your pocket at all time? And I even made this the wallpaper on my phone. <clears throat> what a beauty it is that all the mistakes you've done, Jesus took the blame. We like to point fingers, but we really are to blame. So will you trust him? Will you believe in him? Will you tell others about him? Will you make his death not in vain? Will you believe and live for him that you might see that eternal sun rise? Or will you, will you continue to suffer? He'll take it for you. But you got to own it and give it to him and believe. Father, as we think about these things today, I pray that you've been speaking to us. If there's anybody here that is ready to, to stop doing it their way and, and to come to you, to believe in your son Jesus as Lord and Savior, to confess and repent of their sins, to be baptized. I pray that you'll, you'll move them, you'll bring them to that point or at least have them talk to me later but uh, for all of us if we're already converted I pray that we're more deeply converted by thinking about the passion of Jesus that he suffered so much because he took our place help us to be more deeply converted I pray in Jesus name amen if you have a decision we want you to come let's stand together okay called us to carry out his will to be a light in this dark land 
with a servant's heart we reflect our god in christ in christ alone we stand in christ we live in christ we sing in christ we give we give our everything in christ we rise in christ that at some point in all of our lives we have had conflict with our relationships with our husbands or wives girlfriends and boyfriends siblings classmates co-workers but if you've been able to work through those conflicts then you know how good the peace can be it tells us in Romans 5 1 therefore having been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus it's amazing that we can even have this peace with the one and only, the holy, God Almighty, and He wants peace to, with us. In our human conflicts, we're guaranteed to mishandle things. We don't love perfectly. We don't have perfect patience. We don't understand each other perfectly. We're guaranteed to have conflict. Not so with God. He doesn't have those issues. And he's the one that reached out to us to reconcile. And at some point we have been at odds or in conflict with, with God. 
It tells us in in Ephesians. through 14. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. So as we take the juice and and the bread for communion this morning, let's remember that he willingly shed his blood, subjected his body to be broken for our benefit, so he can reconcile for us with the perfect God, even though we're the ones that have that conflict. So for those who have submitted to that Lordship of Jesus and who have that promise of peace with God, I welcome you to take communion. Let's pray. Father, we don't understand why, as perfect as you are, you reach down to us to provide that, other than you tell us you love us and you want that relationship. So as we take communion this morning, we thank you for that. We remember the sacrifice that it took, but it was willingly done so thankful that you provide that peace to us in Jesus name amen you know this week I've been it's been a tough week it's been a sad week uh, the news from Florida and on Wednesday uh, I will tell you I, I just think I'm sick of it and I'm saddened by it through these shootings uh, just are unconscionable and I, I think uh, I don't have answers. Uh, you know, I'm not up here to give political thoughts, but I do know God's people cannot sit by and do nothing. And I know that we need to be praying for those folks who lost loved ones and the many, many who continue to grieve. Even those that have survived those shootings, they pay a psychological toll, and we need to be in prayer for those folks. Uh, we also need to pray that God might make clear a direction uh, for our country, that we, we avoid these situations. So I'm asking you to pray and to, uh, to lift up those who've lost loved ones, to pray that God might show us a way forward. Let's stand together. <clears throat> I'm going to pray for us. Father, I, I ask you... To, uh, to comfort those who are grieving, to help tamp down the fear of us who, who send our kids to school, who send our wives or our husbands to school, our sons and our daughters. I pray, Father, for uh, you supernaturally to show us and to help us know that we can be part of the solution. Father, I pray for all that mourn, all that grieve. Bind them up. Help them to move forward. And help us in whatever way, each of us individually. Make it known to us how we can be a part of uh, improving this society, these recurring tragedies. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week. We'll see you.